Civilization, started by the legend Sid Meier himself, has been a staple throughout the video game industry. From 1991 to the present day, we have seen consistent releases from games to spin-offs to DLCs to one of the objectively greatest game series we have ever seen exist. I decided to take a trip down back to memory lane and play every Civilization game ever created. Now, I am going to be playing the main series games from Civ 1 and Civ 6 at their final states with all the DLC and updates and rank them in a tier list of sorts. The rankings aren't going to be a best games ranking because it would go from Civ 1 to 6, but instead it'll look on the improvements made on each game and the time period it was released in. As always, if you do enjoy, leave a like and subscribe, and let's get into the video. Now, a very quick disclaimer, Civ 1 and Civ 2 are actually not for sale, so I couldn't buy those games. Hopefully the AFFBI will understand and not bin Laden my booty by raiding my house. I found a website that loved to keep crashing, so it was a struggle to go through those games, but I did end up doing it. And I'm not playing every game to every win condition, because that would take a time sink of at least three to 4,000 hours for me to learn each game and for me to win each victory type. So uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get started. The first game we're going to be taking a look at is Civilization 1. Now, Civ 1 starts out in a loading screen that gave me a blast from the past back when my gaming consisted of Windows XP and Miniclip.com. I didn't know what any of this meant. Like, the Gen Zer I am, I just spammed 1 throughout the entire graphic selection screen into the basic Civ loading screen. After a decent intro, I came into the game setup with the number of civs, and I picked one of the 14 civs available in this game. I did not know the Zulu were in here. Spoiler alert, they're in every Civilization game. I go for Egypt and struggle to fill in my plugin as the leader name was too short, but I did eventually get it done. In these games, civs don't have any unique abilities or units or anything like that. They just start with some free technologies, and after some dude told me I was now an Avenger, The graphics are pixelated, which you can't expect from a 30-year-old game, as I try to bring glory to Egypt. I was given a small overview which really didn't suffice as a tutorial before picking a tech and finding out a little tax rate system, which sort of trades gold for science and luxury happiness at a percentage amount. Libright is in shambles right now. After which, my game exits after I accidentally hit the escape key, and it required me to refresh the entire screen to get back in the game, and since the game wasn't saved, it was just going to be a new game for me. The second round, I got the settle animation screen as I moved my two militia around and came to a primitive tribal village, which I proceeded to go nice place, nigga. and took their iron ore to sell for myself. I have to consistently change production or it'll loop to the same thing after every unit produced, which is kind of annoying, but as I got the tech research animation, it seemed too much in my opinion, but it was still pretty cool nonetheless. I subsequently met Alexander and Big Daddy Stalins in the game, surrounded by primitive hunters, which I thought was a nice touch before my game crashed for real this time. Oh boy, I am about to pull a Stalin and purge this emulator. Tech trading is pretty prevalent in this game and will be for the next three iterations, and Zone of Control actually completely prevented one of my units from moving as Alexander thought it would be funny to lock my unit in and prevent me from doing anything. The next game, I meet Napoleon as I find out the people love me and help me build one part of my palace before telling me to piss off as they only wanted to build one tower at that time. Napoleon calls me the n-word and tries to steal from me before I say no, and he declares war on me. I can't figure out how combat works, so I suicide my units. We do not condone suicide on the Civ Lifer channel. Someone calls me an imposter as I try to convince the people not to kick me out of the spaceship as they snicker and call me funny names. So I'm about to be overthrown by failing the next question. The Civ gods have seemingly seen enough as my game now crashes again. I took that as a sign and am now done with Civilization 1. All in all, it was a pretty innovative for a game released in 91, but the emulator was rough, ruining my experience. There was no real tutorial which had me pressing random buttons to find control, as I didn't even know how to press next turn until about 20 minutes in. Combat is confusing with no health bars, as the main things I really like about the game were the palace building as well as the tax rate, which added some much needed depth to the game. 
Overall, I'll put this in a B tier. For a 1991 game, it was pretty developed, even though being the first game in the series, nothing was really polished. Next up, I loaded into Civilization 2, which has to be the game I really dislike the most. The selection screen was great, as I could even pick the gender I wanted to be, so Civ 2 is definitely going to get a loyal feminist player base after this video publishes. There were a lot more Civs, but being able to pick the Barbarian level definitely is a great change, as I decide to pick the Germans, bribe the viewers to subscribe to my channel, and start my next game. Selecting the city style seems cool, but definitely takes out the immersion when you're Chinese with a Roman infrastructure. The graphics seem better, but there are no more animations that play for settling cities, nor for finding different civs, which is disappointing. The graphics are much improved, as I love they decided to bring back the tax system, which is still dope, as I can be a tyrant and force my citizens to pay insane taxes. There was still no guide as I took years trying to find out how to move before realizing it was the number pad and you can't use the mouse to move units. The lack of tutorials had me struggling and googling everything. Everything seems to take so long as a temple is 40 turns, but I build my army and start exploring. I find a large amount of tribal villages with horsemen before meeting my first neighbor, Egypt, and these portraits are ugly. Wow, I despise these portraits with every fiber in my being. It's the same for every Civ in this game, and also Mao Zedong <laughs> leads China. I realize every unit has attack, defense, move speed, and HP, as it is really a one-shot, one-kill for most of combat. If you attack and have more attack, you win the combat. Instead of a palace, I got to customize a throne room for being benevolent, which is a great minigame that I could see adding up and progressing in the future. First few games are definitely extremely easy all in all, as me spamming settlers had me at the top of every ranking screen as I was dominating the game. I send my horses and archer to declare war on Egypt as I spend the next 10 seconds furiously attacking with range from my archers before I realize archers are now melee units, until about Civilization V. In any case, I take my first city of Thebes easily as I move in to attack the si Egyptian city of Memphis before I get completely wiped out and run with my tail between my legs. As I hit escape again, my game crashes and I think it's another sign I pretty much got what I needed from the game and moved on from Civilization 2 to Civilization 3. Overall, there were good graphical improvements, but the art style choices for portraits were odd. The increased variety in civs was great, but the game really seemed too easy, even on a middle difficulty. I hated the movement even more than the portraits, and the combat, me combat mechanics were really unchanged. The throne room is still pretty cool though, so I'll give it a C tier overall. It didn't really do a lot different from the first game, and some odd choices kind of soured my experience. The next game is Civ 3. Now before I begin Civilization 3, the resolution got messed up with my recording, so if the dimensions are wonky, that's why. But Civs 3 was the first game to introduce the modern leader portraits, as well as unique units and a really interesting Civ focus. The Chinese were industrious and militaristic, which gave specific values, although everyone shared a pool of about 6 to 7 traits, limiting the diversity. Leaders' clothing advanced throughout the eras, which is an amazing flavor thing added in Civ 3 that I wish they'd bring back. And oh my god, Empress Theodora has me acting up. I ain't no simp, but for Theodora, at your service, my queen. The leaders each have their own unique flavors and style, and we get to the, oh my god, the most attractive leader in the entire franchise, Catherine. For those of you saying I am just a horned up kid. Correct! So after picking the only logical option of Russia, I made my game, picked the civs with no ulterior motives at all, and decided to start my game. You still get free techs and tech trading, which is still available, which is neat. The tax system and tech tree is a little hidden in this version, especially with no tutorials still to teach me where everything is. So I settle Moscow as the modern Civ City UI makes its appearance, with giving me turns until growth, production, as well as my population. Something still in the modern Civ games today. I really love the city governor, as you can customize what you want him to do in depth, letting even new players let the AI control the city building as they learn the game. The first tech tree is also introduced to this game, and it's really the prototype for the modern tech tree. A lot of these are sort of prototypes of what we'll see in the future. Sort of, this is the game where Civilization 3 really started making the changes that we would see in modern Civ games. The Civilopedia is much improved, but they aren't separated into sections and instead everything's alphabetical. 
One problem with this game is you don't get a leader meeting screen. You have to go to the unit you find and contact the civilization as we see the Germans nearby who... Wait, who am I playing again? Uh-oh. My borders increasing with culture is different from modern games, but a much better improvement on previous ones. Now, <laughs> don't laugh, but apparently cities in Civ 3 are essentially defenseless, which means I forgot to keep a garrison in, and the Germans walked in almost as easy as they walked into France in 1939, and I lose the game on a technicality of me being a dumbass, and we get this amazingly infuriating sequence where everyone starts bullying my messed up face. They pretty much just jumped me. And I mean, damn, these insults are actually not half bad, with Mao and the Celts being the most aggressive. I would say something about this, but I didn't spend all these years building up my West Taiwanese social credit score to lose it all here. All this made me pissed at all these leaders, except you, my queen, and they best be lucky I didn't face those in five or six. Come to my streets and I'll show you who is messed up. I got mad enough to where I restarted, picked all the same civs, and this is actually the game I spent the most hours on because of this. So I have to say, well played Sid Meier. But I decided to pick Rome for the legions because I was feeling dangerous. In this new game, I built up my empire as I started right beside Theodora, and I spent 30 minutes trying to figure out how to make my city happy again. But just as I was asking Theodora to rejoin the Roman Empire, once again Portugal attacked, but spearmen in this game are a lot better than modern games, as their defense let me defend my cities extremely well. Something I didn't know is re after researching iron for my legions, you don't build a mine for the resource. You need to build a road to each city to get the iron, which is kind of weird. Uh, there's no worldwide strategic resource. You have to join the resource with the city to start the building. After finally figuring out how to make entertainers, I got to improve my palace, which is still pretty dope. But after losing my simp card, I built my legions and declared war on Theodora, surrounded her city before getting destroyed because apparently, if you want to take cities in Civ 3, you need catapults or else you're going to lose. So I restart, same map, and continue doing the same things I was doing before, and was about to attack, but Mao Zedong found out I was the first one to stop clapping at a speech, and declared war on me and took my northernmost undefended city. Even though I enter a golden age, I lose all my catapults as the archer defending them just died and I lost them all to Mao Zedong. Am I terrible or what? Despite my legions being extremely strong against units, catapults only hit half the time and with only two, the barracks in their city kept healing the units and I couldn't take it. Damn. Decided to pick Germany this time for a peacefulish playthrough, and this is where I finally found the tax system and realized why I was so behind in science all game, even though I was on an easier difficulty. The Germany game was uneventful, unless you count leaders changing clothing, which is pretty neat, and I even got myself a gorgeous palace. In the end, I decided to try out the scenarios, which are decently well built. The Napoleon scenario seemed pretty dope, but my dumbass couldn't make combat work in this game, so I said meh. I guess I've done everything in Civilization 3. All in all, the changes they made in Civ 3 were overall good. Disease mechanic limited population. Auto end turn was automatically enabled, which infuriated me because I need to manually switch production or the AI will auto build. And with auto end turn on, that was almost impossible. I did turn it off at the end though. The advisor system is super in depth, but a little hidden but it seems very strong for a human player giving you a lot of information. This was the first game where they had almost everything from the modern Civ formula and would work out the kinks in the future. Lots of creative decisions from Civilization 2 in Civ 3 and a lot of them worked. All in all, I'll give this game an A tier as it improved drastically from Civilization 2. Civilization 4 had about four games after I downloaded it. So I, they decided to download a new game every time a DLC came out. And so the most modern Civ 4 version was Beyond the Sword, which I am playing for this video. As I load into the title screen, the game lets me know that my Core i7 processor is not strong enough to play this game from the mid-2000s. <laughs> Roasted even harder than I was after I lost Civ 3. I load into the game as they decide to bring back multiple leaders per Civ, which was pretty neat as there was a large selection for me to pick from. They kept the leader traits from a small pool, which is fine in my opinion, although some of them seemed absolutely game breaking. I decided to random sieve it and go in for one of my final plugins for this video, and hey, I could add in my entire name this time. That's pretty dope. 
In any case, I spawned in as Peter of Russia, and you could immediately see that this was a modern Civ game. I had a starting unit, settler, and settled in place as I began questing. This is the last game where the resolution problems persisted, so the screen might be wonky again, but we do finally get the modern tech tree in its entirety, letting me beeline any tech I want from start to finish, which is nice. The culture borders made a return, as well as the tax system was now visible in the top left corner, making it easy for me to switch my productions around. The city UI was very nice with the addition of the new health and happiness system, working like amenities and housing for Civilization VI. The culture borders returning also made it a lot more interesting, as growing one super city was still in the cards. I also turned on resource map tax and yield icons, which made for a more familiar civ experience for me. In the early game, you don't fight barbs necessarily, as wild animals take the spotlight for the first 20-ish turns, which improved immersion a little bit. Speaking of combat, there was now a sort of health system, as the more damage a unit get, the less combat strength it had, and it shows you the percentage you have of winning the still all-or-nothing combat system. After meeting a couple civs and settling St. Petersburg, I found the limiting factors for sitting to be maintenance at the most, as most of my money was spent to support all of my cities. It seems you need a lot of money in this game, as the more you have, the more you can fund research and found new cities. This game was a lot easier than Civ 3, but still difficult enough to challenge me nonetheless. As I enter the classical era, I am impressed with the diplomacy screen, as it had everything from me forcing to switch governments, to me trading technologies, after a specific technology this time. I could also more easily assign specialists and work tiles in this game, as the city UI is just a massive improvement over the previous Civ games. I decided to start a new game to try out religion and combat, and I picked Justinian so I could get a free tech, and it would be on the path to founding a religion. Yes, to found a religion, you have to be the first to reach a specific technology for each religion, and I wanted to also make cataphracts, so I decided to go for a religious domination game. I was successfully the first to research and thus founded Buddhism. I checked the advisor screen, and it is, in my opinion, the best in Civilization 4 by far. The amount of information you get from military, research, as well as diplomacy and economic advisors make it almost feel like cheating at a certain point. I eventually forget that about that before Civ 5 cities are pretty much defenseless and you need garrisons as the barbs steal my northernmost cities and assault my capital and I wanted that cataphract rush but my game uh, spontaneously crashed and burned, yes. As I lost all my progress, yes, I actually had to get a new computer. It wasn't me rage quitting because of barbarians or anything. Even the save files were still available. I mean, the save files were corrupted, so I couldn't actually continue the game. I then decided to play the Ottomans and go Janissary rushing as I prepared to check out the combat in this game. I actually tried the Romans at first, but that video file actually got corrupted. But the notes I can say from that game is great generals give you an insane amount of experience and promotions per unit. Speaking of which, promotions are more modern in this game, a lot similar to Civ 5 promotions with a vast array of different bonuses for specific units. The great general you get from combat and the system from Civ 3 is still there, as I needed siege units to make a dent in the walls, which gave bonuses to city defense. So I then decided to pick the Ottomans and quickly set out and build six cities before I lo get locked in by Hammurabi. Now, unlike Civ 6, he is seemingly balanced this game, so I rushed Janissaries and Trebuchets and bombarded his cities until the defense was low enough for my Janissary army to come in. With Poland not becoming a Civ until Civ 5, the siege went flawlessly this time as there were no winged Tazars to come out of nowhere. I took the city of Akkad without too much trouble, and I do want to talk about spies who are very strong as they are a unit that you move into enemy territory and use to sabotage, kind of like what would happen in Civ 6. You can also use them to counter espionage to defend your own lands from enemy spies, and civics in this game are a great option as you pick different economic policies and governments, and even slay... Yeah, okay. They do each have potential drawbacks, but all this made Civ 4, in my opinion, the most strategic big brain game in the entire series, as you had multiple ways to go about your game. Being able to go around the globe was also a cool feature, but finally, the movement in this game is still way too slow, as my units can only move one hex at a time, which limited mobility. Overall, the improvements made in this game were monumentous, and most of what we see here led to the modern Civ games. Civ 4 is the first modern Civ game, and all the great parts of the next game, like religion, unit health, UI screen, were all perfected or introduced in this game. 
All in all, I'm going to put this in the S tier. I understand why there is still to this day a cult following of Civ 4. The game went for big swings and hit on almost all of them, making it the best Civ game to date. Now, on to Civilization 5. Now, on to Civilization 5, being my introduction to the series after Gods and Kings DLC, and it is, in one word, amazing. It was the first real insane success Civ had, as the combination of the improvements of Civ 4 and the graphical art of 5, which is the best in the entire series in Civ 5, objectively better than even Civ 6, made this game insanely accessible. The game setup is extremely streamlined, as you do everything on one screen now. I decided to pick Babylon, one of the strongest Civs in Civ 5, kind of a tradition at this point, and go for one last plug-in before deciding to play on Immortal, because it was the first time I picked this game up since 2018. The in-depth customization was also a bonus as I logged into the game and the narration is top-notch. This is the first fully, fully voiced Civ game, as there are less leaders than Civ 4, but each leader has more personality. They removed general ability system in Civ 4 and gave each unit leader a unique ability in Civ 5, which was a great touch. Loading in, I build my scout, and I have to say the movement in this game is the best, again, better than non-Gran Columbia Civ 5, as you can move on whatever tile you want, as long as you have any movement left. This made exploration a lot more fun and fighting a lot more strategic. With hexes instead of squares now, the map was a lot better made, and the map game exploration was great. Every unit getting to movement speed also sped up the game, and movement felt a lot more smooth, we also get a health bar and stronger cities. This tutorial for the game also made it easy to help you get into the game and helped you out tremendously early on. Strategics now only have to be improved and every city can benefit. Another great improvement in my opinion. City states are a new addition. Small civs that give bonuses if you have at least 30 influence and give you everything, even the resources, at 60 influence when you become their ally. Although you need to have the most influence, even if you have 60, only one ally at a time. Natural wonders are new in this game, as I find that the Suleiman mountain thing gives insane production. The social policy system is for culture now, as well as border growth, which is a lot slower compared to previous games. And the social policies are fun and unique even. But there is a meta, and you're trolling if you don't go tradition or liberty into rationalism, as this is by far the best path. Maybe aesthetics for culture, as the culture victory also got reworked. Didn't want to talk about victory types this video, but it's important in Civ 5 that the tourism system was introduced, and while not the peak culture system, that was Civ 6, all these changes made culture a lot better and usable. Speaking of which, faith and religion was also changed in this game, so you could pick and choose your own religion and beliefs at a certain threshold, 10 to 30 for a pantheon, and 200 for a great prophet and a religion. I get PTSD as Shaka decides to make an appearance, the scourge of Civ, Civ, Civ 5 himself. After waking up from my Vietnam flashback, I settle my third city and take all the tiles from Germany because city pop and tiles worked are the most important thing in this game. The meta is 4-6 to six cities because of happiness and debuffs to science. And speaking of happiness, oh boy. The one red mark on Civ 5, the one failing grade, is they wanted to reduce expansion as the tax system really wasn't working for Civ 4, but happiness made it so that you can really have an empire. You can't have an empire, as even going negative 1 in happiness, it's determined by losing 3 happiness a city and 1 per population, stagnated growth completely, and reduced production massively, and rebels when it even gets high enough. I move my settler and... Uh, oh. I move my settler with the unit because I am smart and understand barbarians do suck before I take them out and nab a free builder, found my religion, get the demographic screen which is pitiful compared to the advisor system in Civ 4. Uh, the spy system was also not as good in my opinion because you can only really steal techs, defend, and later schmooze as diplomats. They also replaced tech trading with research agreements which is a lot better in my opinion as you could easily trade whatever techs you wanted in Civ 4 and before. The new World Congress system is really good and provides a lot in the way of diplomacy, as you could limit nukes, increase great people yield generation, and even increase science for already researched techs. Cannot go against the World Congress wishes, which definitely happened in real life, guys. No one goes up against the League of Nations, right? League of Nations, you want to testify? Uh, though there's another world war again. The final thing I want to talk about is ideology. A replacement for government, but only in the modern era where you have order, autocracy, and freedom. I think I know the basis of all these ideologies. 
They give powerful social policy slots, giving insane production, happiness, and even free units. One problem, though, is if someone has another ideology and a stronger culture than you, you get a massive debuff in happiness, sometimes up to negative 20, which can cripple you and force you to switch. All in all, they are pretty balanced with each other. Order is really for a science game, freedom for culture, and autocracy for domination. All in all, the improvements made in Civ 5 were mostly good, aside from some minor things like the tax system being removed, which I did enjoy in previous iterations. The Golden Age system is too niche, requiring a lot of happiness, unless you are Darius. Happiness you're probably not going to get. The AI also asks way too many requests, which slows down the game when they ask for all my luxuries for one gold and a horse resource. Finally, the game is too tall, as with strong cities and happiness, that is the optimal meta, and it's a lot better to turtle up in this game and go for science instead of going for domination, which I don't like. This game has the most changes and optimizations, combined with which I will give it an S tier ranking. One of the best games in the entire series with the best graphics and movement system. Now let's move on to the final game, Civilization VI. Now, Civ VI is a game my channel is based on, so I'm not going to discuss too in depth about it. But the governors are a nice addition, giving you bonuses, even though the meta is Pingala, Magnus, and Amani. Loyalty replaced happiness, as amenities are a lot weaker than happiness, and loyalty is now the de facto city expansion preventer, which I love, as you can expand to your heart's content while having to deal with something that isn't too overbearing if you want to expand and have happy in loyalty issues. The promotion tree got revamped, as did combat strength, as now instead of percent bonuses, you get straight numbers. The graphics in this game are childish, seemingly trying to draw in a more casual audience than Civ 5, but they are objectively good. The new government system is a step up and leads us into the civic tree. No more social policy, as now culture, religion, and diplomacy are mainly in the civic tree, giving a lot more room for us to use our big brains. The golden age system is also done a lot better, as you get era score for accomplishing deeds and whatnot, and if you pass a certain threshold, you will get a golden age or a dark age if you don't meet the threshold, or a normal age if you're in between. The other great thing is now any victory is viable as there isn't a consensus one strategy to win every game. Cities are weaker in Civ 6, but not as weak as Civ 4. The districts are the bigger change, adding more depth as you need to assign districts to different cities, and it's limited by population growth, so you have to get a balance for the victory path you are going for. The Great People generation is now nationwide as districts and their building provide their Great People points, but you can also patronage them, letting you spend faith and gold to acquire Great People. Religion is the same from 5 without too many changes, although you do need holy sites to get the great people. There is a lot more variety as in Civ 4 with different civs and leaders, but everything is fully voiced like Civ 5. The spy system also took the best things from 5 and 4, less drastic changes but more rolling back like Civ 5 spies and happiness, as well as the envoy system for city-states which made it more strategic than just throwing every money you had at a city-states and diplo favor instead of diplo votes are a lot better, as you can save some diplo favor if you know a decision is going to be passed, letting you spend it in the late game when you are close to winning. Climate change is really unnoticeable and an annoyance more than anything. It's not going to prevent you from building fossil fuels, as the limit of the resources will. Natural disasters are pretty annoying and are in G-ish, but they do have their benefits to yields, kind of doing what disease did in Civilization 3. Tourism is a lot easier than Civ 5, and rock bands help you get over that late game grind. And this game was meant to be more casual and appear appeal to a wider demographic, which it definitely succeeded in. Now, before I rank it, the music was definitely the best in this series, no doubt. Whoever composed this music deserves the, just the best money anything can buy, I guess. Best in the series. Overall, an A-tier ranking as it went less for major changes and more for refining the system of the last two Civ games, which gives it a great grade in my book. If you do enjoy, please leave a like and subscribe and let me know which series you want to see me do next down below in the comments and I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.